Andy. Um, welcome everybody to the second panel today, which is on global Britain and the balance between hard and soft power. Um, we have a very distinguished lineup, so I'm not going to spend too long introducing them because you know who they are. But very briefly, um, uh, I'll give you the, their, their, their brief background, but also uh, something of a running order because I know that uh, the chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee has to leave at about uh, half past. So he will speak second. Uh, first of all, we have uh, Kieran Devan, who is the chief executive of the British Council. The British Council's written, uh, uh, produced a lot of important research on this question of hard and soft power, and he will go first. Uh, next, we'll have Tom Tugendat, the chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee, uh, an author of a number of policy exchange reports in this area of Britain's influence abroad across the whole spectrum of hard and soft power, and I would refer to one very important piece of work co-written uh, and produced in 2016 with the late Joe Cox on the cost of doing nothing, a very important and influential report which led to the uh, recreation or reinvigoration of the old parliamentary uh, uh, group on atrocity prevention. Um, uh, then we'll have uh, Bar Baroness Abrinka Helic, who is uh, former Special Advisor of the Foreign Secretary and also sits on the Lords Committee on International Affairs. And then finally, last but not least, uh, Khaled Mahmood, Bur uh, MP for Birmingham Parry Bar, uh, and also sh Shadow um, uh, uh, Spokesman for Foreign Affairs. So first of all, Kieran, if you could kick it off. Right. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I want to start with kind of theory of international relations. If, if, if you go back to the kind of the textbooks, they talk about um, three competing theories. One is the realists who say, at the end of the day, you need a big economy and a good military because you can't trust the neighbors and anarchy rules. Then you have the institutionalists who say, it's about a rules-based international system, it's about us all playing nicely together, and we can make things happen, whether it's through the United Nations or the European Union or, or whichever. And the constructivists who say, we're a product of our history and our experience. If we can help people experience things differently, then we'll make the world a better and a safer and more prosperous place for, for us as well. Now, I think where our research is going is saying two things. One is you need all three points of view. These are not competing theories, they're self-reinforcing theories. And all three lenses are valid at the same time. And the, the second point is, if you really want to worry about security, prosperity, and influence, then you need the full spectrum. Uh, and whether you call it full spectrum approach or fusion strategies or whatever, we mean the same thing. You know, we need good development. We need you know, capable, uh, hard power. We need intelligent, soft power, cultural relations, cultural diplomacy, whatever you want to um, call it. And therefore, the instruments you use need to cover the whole base. They need to be military and diplomatic. You need you know, business and the economy to be working. And you need civil society and the kind of cultural education sector to be engaging internationally uh, as well. Now, the good news, I think, from our point of view as the UK is that there are reasons to be cheerful. Um, and if I can give you two, one is the um, the nation brand work that Simon Arnhold would do, which is say it's actually very difficult to change your nation's brand. Um, you need to do something which is um, sending an infallible signal in his phrase if you're going to change your brand for better or for worse. And therefore, there are things you can do, and you might angst about them, but they won't necessarily change what the rest of the world thinks about you. This was reinforced when we did a piece of work uh, where we surveyed 20,000 18 to 34 year olds across the G20 in the run up to the referendum. And then again, 20,000 young people, 18 to 34 year olds, after the referendum to try and see what the difference was. And the, the good news in inverted commas is that outside the European Union, broadly people didn't notice. Um, you know, it was big for us, not so big for them. Um, and it was, yeah, you know, that's lovely, but we're more worried about, you know, the typhoon. You know, it, it's really interesting, but can I talk to you about education? Within the European Union, it was different, but it was bounded. So what young people were saying was that, um, actually, we still think the UK is the fourth most attractive country in, in the world. That did not shift. Um, we think the people mightn't be quite as friendly as we thought, and we, you know, the, the government might have be, been a bit sort of less collegiate than we thought. Um, but actually, we still love the things about the UK that we love. So we love the institutions of the UK. 
we, uh, the BBC, the rule of law, the things that make Britain Britain, we, we don't think it changed between the 22nd of June and the 24th of June a uh, couple of years ago. So the re reasons to, to, to be cheerful. Um, so what do we actually need to do? Um, a couple of the phrases that came up in the earlier panel was we need to kind of lean into the problem, and I completely agree with that. We need to be active in our engagement. If we look at what our competitors are doing, um, you know, we could talk about China. You know, when we talk about the uh, increasing capability of the Chinese military, but they are investing in a thousand Confucius institutes around the world as well. So they are getting active in the soft power, power space in the same way that they are getting more capable in the uh, hard power space. We need to um, work together. We need to say that there are things that we can do with other countries which are in our mutual interest. Um, and we need to maintain and sustain those coalitions. So if you're looking at building a coalition in the United Nations, yes, we're not going to do it alone. So let's use that institutional power that we have going forward. Uh, we need to participate. We need to make sure, uh, again, picking up on the theme earlier, one of the things we're trying to position is that every young person in the UK will have an international experience through their education. So let's lean into the problem. So having said in one way we should be less angst, angsted about uh, what uh, has been going on, I think there's one way we should be more um, angstful uh, about what is going on. And I, I, want to, I want to talk a bit about values. And we see this across our network in the 115 countries or so that we, we work in. Um, we see a rise in extremism, in intolerance, in the erosion of rules and norms in many, many of our partners. And you don't have to go very far um, for that. In France, we ended up with Macron, um, but actually, you know, Le Pen did quite well. You know, just keep going east. My equivalent in two Eastern European countries have lost their jobs for being the wrong type of citizen of, of that country. Um, we know that the erosion of belief in a truth in the news is causing a problem. Uh, we have you know, the leaders of a major global economy saying trade wars are OK. Uh, so we have an issue. So I think the big strategic issue, which we do need to worry about, and we need to complement development, complement diplomacy, complement hard power, is this issue of what do we need to do as the thing we used to call the West to sustain our values, to sustain those norms by which we built a society after the war. And what do they look like going forward? They may not be precisely the same, but we do need to actively work to su sustain them. So if we look at some of the work, let's say, that Respublica did, where they talked about the power of example, that one of the great things we have as Britain is great examples of good things, whether it's the rule of law in the courts, whether it's democracy, uh, whether it is you know, access to education and healthcare, that we need to understand what those attributes are and actively manage them. Because we know that when we do, and people have engaged with the UK, that they are more likely to trust the UK and more likely to trade with the UK, and there's an evident, evidence base be, behind that. So I think my view is um, and I love the comment uh, earlier that maybe we should be talking 3%, not 0.7%. We need to say that we need an adequately resourced military. We need an adequately resourced development budget. We need an adequately uh, resourced uh, diplomatic service. And we need an adequately resourced, let's call it, cultural relations sector. Um, so the challenge I think we have is how do we do that? And how do we create a consensus where we don't all look at things through our own individual <coughs> lens. So that if we're talking to people who come from a hard power background, then they look at things from a hard power point of view. How do we l talk to the development sector so that they appreciate the, you know, the other levers which will have uh, an impact? And how do you talk to people like me to say actually hard power is okay too? So that's our challenge. It's around how do we build a consensus around having this spectrum and that we all collaborate together and we give the government of the day the chance to say, for this particular international problem, what's the right mix of tools that I should be using? Not just saying, what tools do I have? Therefore, they, they're the only ones I can use. Thank you. Thank you, Gerard.
Tom, could you tell us what Global Britain is by way of kicking off? Well, I, I, <laughs> I was going to start off actually by thanking Kieran for giving me the perfect um, lead into my uh, topic because I was going to start off by talking about the work that Joe and I did uh, just over a year ago. And the point of that report, the reason it was so important to both of us is that we both came from very different perspectives on it. I'd spent uh, the best part of 10 years as a soldier and she had spent the best part of, I think, about 20 years actually uh, working in the aid space. And yet we were both uh, passionate about the ability for government to intervene when necessary, when appropriate. That report was also very carefully written so that it doesn't say on all occasions intervention must be military, nor does it say, by the way, on no occasion must intervention be military. It identifies the fact that there are, as uh, Kieran put it quite rightly, there is a spectrum of tools, and choosing the right tool for the right occasion is the challenge. I was also very struck, actually, by what he said about branding. Um, in my shameful and tawdry past, I did once work in public relations, and uh, for which I, I have no apology uh, great enough that I can make. Um, <laughs> but having moved on from that, I can tell you I, I did do a little bit on branding, and particularly with some of the world's largest companies. And one of the, one of the challenges that was perfectly clear was once a brand is established, it's very, very hard to change it. And one of the challenges that uh, I had in, uh, with one of my clients at the, in those days was that, and in fact, I'll, I'll talk about it because it's, it became such a cause célèbre. There was a photograph in Time magazine of a man praying in the desert, a Muslim man praying in the desert, and he happened to be praying next to a Coca-Cola sort of pedal bicycle, if you see what I mean, a cooler bin. And at no stage was there any suggestion that this was in any way part of his praying ritual. It just happened to be in front of him as he was facing towards Mecca. And the caption read, praying to the new God. And of course, this caused Coca-Cola the most extraordinary amount of trouble. <laughs> it was absolutely not their fault. They had done nothing about it. They were simply reaping the reward or the inverse, whatever, the punishment of a photographer who had taken a photograph for Time magazine. And they spent, quite literally, millions of dollars trying to repair the damage. And every few years, by the way, if you're wondering how bad the damage is, if every few years, this story comes up again as an example of Coca-Cola seeking to subvert Islam. And every few years, Coca-Cola again <laughs> launches another campaign to point out that it wasn't them, they didn't mean it, it was nothing to do with them, and it was all a mistake. But there is an advantage to this, of course, and that's the point that Kieran made. It's that the reputation for the rule of law, the reputation for judicious intervention, I use the word carefully, and also occasionally uh, judicial intervention, is one that the United Kingdom has benefited from. And it's therefore one of the things that we should focus on. Because the reality is we're not going to reinvent ourselves in this post-Brexit world as some sort of stunning uh, new country that nobody has ever heard of. We're going to reinvent ourselves in the way that people wish to see us. And the key, therefore, is to remember the bits that people value about us and to focus on those. And here, I think, when we're talking about uh, hard and soft power, I think there's one policy that, in a funny way, I think should sum us up. And that's that we should be boring. We should be boring because boring is good. Boring is predictable. Boring uses the rules. Boring doesn't surprise people. And boring is therefore something that people can depend upon. And so when we're looking at Britain's policy going forward, we want people to know, for example, that European citizens aren't going to be expelled from this country on the 29th of March 2019. I mean, we know that because we know the judges would never allow it, even if uh, fools on my side or, or on Khalid's side voted for it. The judges would never allow it. That's boring because it's predictable. When we look at things like um, whether or not we're going to uh, fulfill our commitments in whatever the negotiations end up agreeing, of course we will because we are dependent and boring. And if we're going to stick by our international alliances that we've built up over the last 50 or 70 years, of course we will because we are boring and predictable. And that's important. Because it means that when we go into negotiations, and in fact, the European ones are an important example, they're not the only one, and we talk about security, the Prime Minister has been 
uh, attacked by some for saying that she's brought up security. Actually, she's done rather the reverse. What she said is, this goes without saying. She said, this is, this is something I'm actually removing from the table, and I'm identifying it to tell you that it's not even up for negotiation. Because again, we are boring and predictable. And we're boring and predictable, not because we lack imagination, but actually because we've thought about these things rather hard for a number of years. And we've come to some settled judgments. And on security in Europe, for example, we have decided, after several hundred years of experimentation, that it is better to have the British border far away from Dover and not up to the cliffs. We have decided that it is better to work with others rather than to try to cobble together alliances at the last minute. And the same is true of the rule of law. The reason we are, despite much frustration that some of us have with judges at various points in our lives, we are not going to find ourselves expelling judges who decide to enforce pre-existing conditions of residency, for example, is because over the last few hundred years, we have tried what it's like to live without the rule of law, and we've tried what it's like to live with it. And we have decided, quite rightly, that one is better than the other. So when we're talking about foreign policy, we need to talk about the reality of UK experimentation domestically and abroad, and realize that that spectrum that Kieran so rightly spoke about is exactly what we're going to be looking to in the future. Now, of course, the world does change. And so as we're talking about the rule of law, there are some things that we've also got to look at. And that is looking at how people's place within that changes. And China and India offer two very important examples. I'm going to stay with China for the simple reason that it's easier for the moment, as you will see, for me to express it through China. But China is asserting herself in a way that she hasn't in many ways for the best part of 100, 200 years. But the reality is that an Asian power, whether it be India or China or an empire variation of either of them, has been the dominant political force in the world for the best part of 2,000 years, with only a couple of hundred years exceptions starting in about the 1700s. Except for that, an Asian power has been dominant. So the rise of China and the rise of India can hardly be seen as a surprise, more of, you like, in statistical terms, a reversion to the mean. Now what we've got to do is we've got to make sure that that reversion to the mean fits within a rules-based system. And this isn't in order to constrain China in a sort of a rigid sort of militaristic sense. That would be wrong. It's in order to assist China and to assist ourselves, to realize that the rules liberate us all. Predictability enables us all. And therefore, actually, working with China as part of our efforts is absolutely essential. And that's why, in fact, George Osborne was right when uh, he put Britain at the forefront of the uh, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. And that's why the work of Dali Alexander, much unheralded and, and, and barely noticed in the UK, is absolutely essential. Because what he's doing is he's helping the Chinese write the rules that, of course, work for them. I mean, nobody's, nobody's a fool about this. Of course they work for them. But they work for everybody, too, because the rules make people predictable. And if we can make, in the same way as we can make ourselves, but if we can make China boring, then that, too, is to everybody's advantage, because predictability, as I say, is good for everyone. Now, there are many challenges here, of course, because experimentation or ideas like One Belt, One Road are clearly challenging the international order in a different way. And so we need to restructure how we think about you know, rules of the sea, rules of maritime navigation, how we need to think about uh, standards. But if you think that most standards were created in the building just over there, whether it be the Plimsoll line or, or, or the size of the shipping container, it is hardly surprising that China is now having different ideas as to standardization. And it is absolutely fair that she should. The question is, how do we work together to make sure that those standards, that those principles, work for all of us. So that, I think, is the challenge for global Britain. It's not, it's not to be a new empire, but it's to fall back on that thing that we recognize in ourselves, that thing that is valued, which is the rule of law, which is the independence of the judiciary, which is the understanding that we are a rules-based people who understands how to be boring and to help others to do the same. And of course, if we want uh, examples on uh, how not to be boring, we have plenty of examples. One 
uh, rather sudden one this weekend, or rather last weekend, about um, perhaps the beginnings of a trade war, which I hope won't happen, but <laughs> that is being interesting. Or we can look at uh, the politics of Russia and see the, the way that it is throwing up the international norms, challenging not only the rules-based order, but the uh, lines that we drew in 1945, and challenging the international system. So I would, I would argue I'm afraid, uh, and it's an odd political statement perhaps, but boring is good. Thank you. Thank you. Well, neither predictable nor boring. Thank you very much. Uh, Baroness Ellick. Well, I would just add, if we can have boring and predictable, I hope that involves reliable as well. Absolutely. And uh, that was... Leads to reliable. Leads to reliable, yes. So anyway, I, I see that everyone's taken 10 minutes. I will try to be as short Sorry. as possible, <laughs> both of you. And I know people will want to ask questions, so I will try to sum my little argument in a couple of minutes. Uh, I, I must say I'm still uh, in, in a post-Brexit shock. I can, can't get my head around the fact that there's going to be post-Brexit Britain. Uh, but there is going to be one, so uh, we have to live with it and we have to make it work. And to make it work, uh, I, I, I get encouraged every time that our Foreign Secretary uh, uses the word global. And every time I hear the same coming from number 10 and other, uh, other government departments. And I hope that this global does not exclude regional and that in our pursuit of global and looking in the far away towards the faraway places that are very important, we don't uh, forget that there is a European continent that is our backyard and that we need to remain strongly engaged with it. And I also hope that when we talk about global, our global does not necessarily mean only trade. Uh, global, for me, ought to represent in terms of how Britain engages with the world, how it projects its power through upholding its values and uh, what it stands for at home. I hope we can stand for uh, abroad as well. And uh, a very short point I want to like to make. We, we often talk about, in order for Britain to be effective in the world, it needs to be able to project power. It is confusing uh, when we talk about uh, soft power or hard power, and the debate has somehow pushed these two concepts so far away from each other that sometimes we choose, this, choose to go for one or for the other. And as we, we, we have seen, it isn't possible to exclude one from the other, and I think the best example for me is the way we have engaged in Syria. We have sort of tried to tackle this crisis by aiding our way out of it. Mm -hmm. There is no amount of billions, there is no amount of aid of nice, nice words and nice statements that is going to help this crisis be re resolved. So I think we ought, to, we ought to be a bit more conscious that you cannot have one kind of power at exclusion of another, particularly where there is a military solution, unfortunately, or diplomatic solution to a particular issue. And I uh, agree with, uh, with my colleague from... Um, uh, British Council that we ought to look at it as a fusion of uh, capabilities that we have uh, when acting uh, internationally. And when we do so, we need to not take one at an exclusion of another. And to be able to be capable of acting internationally, we cannot have a situation that we have at the moment where you have a uh, foreign office uh, that is virtually getting depleted by each uh, uh, each sort of uh, spending review where, for example, in order for us, I just had an answer question in the, in the Lords, in order for us to open 50 diplomatic posts in, Brit in, in Europe to cope with Brexit, we have to make cuts of 4.2 million and cut the diplomatic places elsewhere in Africa and Asia. I mean, it kind of doesn't sit... Uh, in a logical way, if we want to be global, why are we withdrawing from one place in order to fill in gaps elsewhere? So there seems to be a gap uh, that is necessary to be filled in, in terms of spending and in terms of making this department that is supposed to be a leading diplomatic thinking department needs to be able to do so. And particularly if we are disengaging from a block where we used to have capability of, of, of covering 20 plus countries, we are now ha having to develop the uh, bilateral relationship with them. We need more rather than less. And my second point is that uh, if uh, foreign office is caught between uh, MOD and DFID, then MOD cannot again be another department that goes through salami slicing each time we have a defense review 
not only that we don't have the necessary capability, but we don't have the necessary funding to support that capability to help us project that power. Because you can have, I don't know, as much um, uh, nice... Uh, engagement and d development aid and you can have as much as uh, you want of cultural diplomacy but you're only going to be taken seriously if you have a strong uh, military behind that and I'm not saying that we should ought to be threatening anyone but I think that we need to all these elements of power need to be played in a concert with each other so if you imagine the way I look at it uh, power I've just thought of a better for is if you imagine that you're a conductor and you have an orchestra occasionally you will turn up here and turn down here, you have to be able to draw on these levers of power in order to engage in the world in which you are trying to project your own interests and in which you are trying to engage with, with that world. And if we do that and we have this balance in terms of how we fund our departments that are supposed to be engaging with the outside world, then we are not going to su su succeed in that. So my hope is that as we uh, march forward towards global Britain, that that global Britain is not going to be turning back on uh, our near neighbourhood, that our global Britain is going to in ensure that we have the capability to carry forward whatever ambitions we have in a balanced way and that we are not going to fast forward in a way where one department is suffering uh, the, because of, of uh, unbalanced funding towards other departments. And I think only if we have all that put together in a, in a, and we think of power as a, as, a, as a complete, we will be able to proceed and we will be able to uh, uh, make sure that our interests are best protected and best promoted. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think if we're looking at this new post-Brexit uh, world, I think it's also important for us to look at the arena in which we'd be competing. Uh, and I think, as uh, a couple of my colleagues have mentioned, the point of view of Russia. Uh, let me start off with, uh, sorry, uh, China. Let me start off with that. And I think the important thing around China and what has happened is the way the Chinese power, uh, and I'll say this in terms of colonization, is working, and I say colonization and trade and, and the way that they're putting the whole infrastructure in to deal with that. If you look at CPAC right across Pakistan, opening a new avenue of trade, uh, saving them literally thousands of miles in terms of sea transport. If you look at the railway infrastructure they're putting across the whole of the world in order to get their stuff across, right across to Europe. If you look at what's happening in Africa in terms of where they are actually colonizing uh, certain areas, uh, particularly of Central Africa, where there are now uh, sort of Chinese-speaking local languages marrying locally and, and into those sort of arenas. So that market in terms of China is there. In terms of Russia, you've got this hard military power that's coming through the new polo, the, the doctrine in, in, in the Middle East, in the Gulf, uh, that's portraying the power that they're portraying. The power in terms of the uh, uh, digital interference uh, within the European and the UK environment and that, th those sort of environment. Uh, and then you've got the unpredictability, unpredictability uh, of the U.S., as, uh, 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 as Tom said, in terms of uh, the announcement over the weekend of a trade uh, sort of uh, discussions that the president is having in relation to that. So I think the arena uh, post-Brexit is going to be very difficult uh, in order for us to see how we can operate within that field and do that. But in order to subvert that, in order to actually make a headway, is the values that we have and the values and the ways that we worked previously. Uh, and to that end, I think it's important to look at what, what, where we've been, I think, in terms of the diffid support that we've got, we've got uh, and, the, and, the, and, and the predictability and the boringness of sticking to a percentage uh, that we decided to stand to. Uh, I think it's hugely and fundamentally important in doing that and the work that we've done. Uh, and I think it's important to look at a lot of the work that we do, well, a lot of the work that we do with, with, with the NGOs uh, across those different countries, uh, the work that we do within conflict areas and how we, how we deal with that. That stands us in very good stead. But I also have a slight criticism uh, of, our divi di uh, of our DFID operations, the way that we work. One of the big problems that we have in terms of the way we deliver our DFID aid uh, is the issue of who delivers what in which area. By us using certain external consultants, and I don't need to name them, I think most of us know who they are, 
and, and what they actually deliver and what legacy, what mentoring, what support they leave behind when those contracts are finished. That, I think, is a fundamental in terms of the work that we do with DFID. Because if you are to leave that legacy, if we leave to, 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 to leave that footprint that we want to, that as soon as that project's funding finishes, what we can't do is evacuate ourselves and leave a vacuum where it was, unless we're able to leave people with the learning, with the understanding, with the know-how to continue to develop those programs, then that money, it just evaporates uh, until when that project is finished. And my big concern, and I've spoken to a number of people across certainly Southeast Asia uh, and some in Africa who have said this regularly, is that what is the legacy uh, of the work that's left? And so I think it's very important uh, for us to look at how we do those projects. I think it's also very important to leave our values uh, where, where we finish. And I think one of the problems that we've got, we've got Commonwealth coming here and issues around that, just within the Commonwealth, uh, the DFID spend that, understanding of the LGBT rights and how we portray those across. Understanding of democracy, how we understand that to people. And if we are able to help those NGOs, those institutions on the ground, to understand those very important values, then we can get a movement. Unless we're able to support those people to change that, there are a huge amount of people who actually want to do that at the grassroots in those communities, in those sort of uh, societies where it's very difficult for an ordinary voice to be heard to be able to move forward. If we are to operate different in a way that we do, we have to be a lot more uh, uh, switched on in order to see whether we get delivery from those programs. It's not good enough just to say that we've got a committed uh, percentage now and we're going to stick to the 0.7 and we're going to deliver. It's the value of those projects that we deliver which is really important. I think that's fundamentally the way that we've got to look at that. Uh, I think one of the big successes that we have, uh, and Karen's here, in terms of the British Council, in terms of our relationship in soft power, British Council is huge. It is phenomenal. If you go anywhere, and I've gone right across most, most of the, right to Indonesia, right across to Africa, uh, and you look at the role of the British Council, it's virtually revered by people. And that's what you want to be able to do, because those people then have a connection with our values, with our ideals, with our, with our view of democracy. And that is fundamentally the things that we need to do, is not to compete with China in terms of the infrastructure, the trade, and the huge resource they have to be able to deal with, <coughs> not to deal with the might of America uh, in the way that they deal with it, but our uniqueness. <coughs> that is what, fundamentally what's important, is that we're unique, we have a huge history with those people. And I think it's time now that we, we, we decided to put much more back into that and get those people to understand our connection with them to be able to do that. And I think the British Council does that fundamentally well. DFID does it, but I think I want to see just a little more improvements. One key area, which I, I don't want to be party political here, but I think I have to criticize slightly the government, is I know you don't. Uh, the higher education uh, sector. Uh, the block <coughs> that we have on student visas is phenomenally damaging to us. Uh, it's damaging to our institutions, to our universities, uh, I have a university in my constituency which suffers hugely from the lack of overseas students coming <coughs> over. And I think if we're able to... One of the big factors I found... I, I worked in the Middle East uh, before that. I, I had a life uh, before I became a politician. I'm an engineer uh, by profession, so I, you know, uh, I understand that side of it. So one of the key things that was with that uh, was to see the, still the support and value they have for us, but we're not able to translate that into contracts, into business into the understanding that they have. But because we don't quite work with some of those people to do that. And having students who come here, who study here, who understand our structures, who understand our systems, who understand our values, to get them to be able to go back and put that in, they will have an everlasting link, as they do to the British Council. They will have, as they will do through, through the work that we do through DFID. So we're getting at all tiers of society in those countries to do that. So in order for us to compete post-Brexit, post I think it's a phenomenal position for us to be in. But if we are to take uh, advantage of that position, of our heritage, of our understanding of those countries, people don't necessarily want to go to the continent of Europe because the language barriers that they get. It's much easier for them to trade with us because the language has been there for a long time. Most of the world speaks our language quite fluently. Uh, and so therefore, easier for them to do that. 
So I think we're not taking the capital that we need to do post this Brexit, post the relationship that we, we're going to have with the rest of the world, and continued relationship uh, in terms of that we have with Europe as well. So I think we, we have all those institutions that we want to be working through. And we need to do that in order to move forward. So I think I'll leave it there because I think everybody else has taken enough time and so have I. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Khaled. Uh, we, we lose the, the, uh, the chair of the Foreign Affairs uh, yeah. Committee, unfortunately. Um, but but uh, there's time for some questions, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, um, if you have any hands. I Actually, there's a couple of questions. Can we take the lady over here, please? Yeah. And microphone. Hi, uh, Abigail Watson, the Remote Warfare Programme. Um, throughout the day, there's been, um, a, there's been talk of the need for a consolidated whole of government approach to the root causes of conflict. But that doesn't seem new. I mean, since 2010, we see it in the SDSR, building stabilities overseas and in the rationality behind the NSC. I wonder why are we still not achieving it? What, substan what substantial change do we need? I, it seems it, like it goes beyond the need for funding. I mean, if we look in Libya, the FCO is undermining the MOD and Yemen, DFID seems to be being undermined. What substantial changes do we need to make that actually happen? Very good question. Yeah. Anyone? Shall I go first? Yeah. Um, I, I think there are two things. One is the one I alluded to is we still look at things through our own lens and we still believe that our way is best. So my aid is nicer than your you know, hard power. Um, and until we get over that and we understand the nuances about when we are not the right solution but somebody else is, I, I think that's one problem. And the other one is just purely structural, uh, the, the mechanisms. And I know the um, National Security Secretariat uh, are looking at how they promote this idea of having a, a fusion doctrine. Um, but it will mean that some of the rest of us will need to get over ourselves and say we're very happy to play in this space. Because if you want to solve Libya, it's a 20, 30 year game. Uh, so it isn't just you know, the next three year program that can, can you get it funded or you know, one particular dimension of the intervention. It's what's our holistic strategy for supporting the people and the governments of, government of Libya to, uh, uh, to get its own way. So I think it's partly structural, partly it's us. Yeah, I, I think you're right, Karen. I, and I think the issue is that we've got to start talking to each other. Our departments have got to start to talk to each other. And we've got to start to look at a long-term objective <coughs> to achieving that. Uh, and if we don't do that, if we look at piecemeal issues, we don't do that. And most fundamentally important is that what we've got to be able to do is get the thinking of those people to understand what it is about democracy, what it is to do away from uh, terrorist activity, what it is to do of taking action themselves. They're not might be terrorists, they might be people in the, in the pro-military or whatever, but the action that they take sometimes is horrendous. So they've got to understand the values of what they stand for. Unless we're able to get that across in, in a medium term to be able to get that delivered, it's not going to work. And if I can just uh, point, uh, following Vakira's one is that we often show lack of strategic patience mm -hmm. We think that if we walk in, uh, uh, intervene, pull out because it's not, it's not sustainable to have uh, military on the ground and then uh, throw in uh, aid uh, that we can sort of say, we, job done, we can walk away from it. I often think about Germany. Uh, when uh, Germany was initially occupied and then not, and you know, even today you have American presence in Germany on the ground. We expect when we go into areas, whether as a part of a coalition or as a part of NATO, etc., that we can just pull out and leave it somehow that is going to self-heal and it's going to fix itself. And if I can give a, an example that's close to my heart, because I was born in Bosnia. Bosnia was, in the 1990s, a poster child of success of a military intervention. In 2006, we decided we are going to pull back and we are going to somehow leave it fix itself. Somehow it's going to work itself towards a perfect uh, uh, society. Instead, we have leave, left the space for the Russians that have got involved now, that are arming one side against another, that are spreading lies through Russia Today and Sputnik, and that are doing absolutely everything to foster, to, to kind of like fester element of instability that will actually prove that our model of building democracy, etc., doesn't work. So I think we ought to show 
element of strategic patience when we get involved. And if we are not prepared to see this through, we should be honest about it at the very beginning and not get in. And we should also insist that from our allies, whether that's through the EU or uh, whether it's through special relationship with the United States or any other country that we work with, if you get involved in say there and see it through, you will and then show by example that it can be done. So far, we have shown by the example it cannot be done because we haven't got patience. We, have, we cannot see through that, whatever the, whether it is through military or whether it is through diplomatic or whether it is through a aid um, involvement. Or, so we need to be a bit more patient, stay a bit longer, and make sure that we work with the generations that are going to be new and are going to see their country in a new, open, democratic, transparent, non-corrupt way. Thank you. So gentlemen, put a hand up over here. Yeah. Name an organization, please. Hi, um, Lawrence Kay, um, PX alumnus and uh, consultant economist to the World Bank. Um, there's been a lot of discussion this morning about values, um, and I'd actually put it across that perhaps values is the easy discussion to have, and that particularly if you're talking in soft power and development terms, it's problem identification, problem management, and commitments to problems that you think you can solve with the re resources that you have is where all the hard questions are. And in that, one has to pick a number of countries. DFID has picked a number of countries which it is concentrating on. And I would invite the panel to perhaps uh, interestingly speculate on which countries we think we can solve problems in over the next 20 to 25 years. Is that perhaps Uganda, because it has some democratic strengths we're interested in? Is it Nepal, perhaps because we have some historical links with the, the continent? Or is it somewhere like Uzbekistan, which is opening up perhaps at the moment not quite clear the direction the country is going in, but is at the very frontier of perhaps things that Britain could be very ambitious about changing and pushing into the Central Asia space against the Kremlin, against Sputnik, against our team. So yeah, just speculation on a few countries that we might be committed to would be interesting. Thank you. Um, can I just say, I don't agree that the value thing is easy. I think the analysis of the value thing is the easy thing. What on earth to do about it is actually incredibly difficult. Um, and it, it's the strategic patience point, uh, I think. You know, what does forward engagement look like? What does you know, saying, I, what will I be able to tell you in 20 years' time about our relationship? So I would pick Russia. Uh, I think there are things we can do about keeping the door open with Russia um, and making sure that we continue to build relationships, continue to build um, you know, alliances and in inverted commas uh, with Russia so that the day that you know, there isn't a strategic tension, you know, we'll have something to work with beneath. Uh, I think long-term engagement with China, um, the lot of the leaders who are coming through at the moment studied here in the UK at the time of the opening up. Um, and then there's the Pakistans and the Indias and the Colombias where we have major contributions to make, where we can leverage our own experience. And the you know, if you look at our Northern Ireland experience, which was a relatively small conflict in absolute terms, you know, it's 20 years since the Belfast Agreement. It's 50 years, practically, since the start of the violence. You know, we know how to do this, and we need to share that experience with the Colombians of the world as we prepare for the day after peace in Syria uh, and get those conversations going now. Um, so I think the, the I mean, values yeah, we can be very fluffy, but what do we really mean and what are we really going to do about it? I think it's very hard. If I was going to choose a country, I would probably uh, choose a region and then I would choose a country. In terms of the country, I would go for Tunisia because I think it is, it's a kind of a small, it's manageable. It's a country that has managed to go through its Arab Spring times in the least violent way. And it's a country where if we show commitment uh, patience, it, it, and, it, and it, we show understanding, we can, if we are really engaged for years, probably even decades together with our allies, whether it's France or Italy, etc., we can make progress. And then we can make that a reference point to the rest of the region of that it is possible to be a Muslim country and it is possible to be a country that has a rule of law and it is a possible country where women are treated in a, in a decent way and you have uh, you know, non-corruption, transparency, etc. But it cannot happen overnight. I really think we ought to show that understanding that you have to virtually work with a new generation that hasn't been uh, corroded by the old practices. And for that, it takes time. And I would 
argued that Tunisia in terms of North Africa and uh, in terms of our understanding of how what the next stage ought to be if we want to have influence uh, of, of Arab Spring, then I would focus on Tunisia. In terms of a region, I would focus on our backyard, and that is in the Balkans, where we have enormous penetration of Russian oligarchization of both institutions, uh, politics, deliberate corruption of, of, of institutions and politics, and undermining what has been achieved since the uh, mid-1990s. And I would engage there strongly with the European Union, through European Union, through, your, uh, through with the United States, etc., to make to kind of push back on that uh, Russian penetration because I think that our security actually uh, does depend on how how stable or not that part of the world is in terms of trafficking, in terms of arms trafficking, people trafficking, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, but the 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 most important thing from my experience, and uh, I spent some time in the Foreign Office, is to show both commitment, strategic patience, and political will. Nothing changes overnight. A democracy does not uh, come into being because you had elections, free and fair elections with observers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I mean, even the countries that didn't go through violent uh, experiences over the last 50 years, like uh, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, etc., are struggling with the way they're managing and with the way they're living their democracies. And I think we need to take that on board when we are engaging with the, with the countries where we want to make certain or achieve certain level of stability. So as I say, my pick would be Tunisia, small, manageable, in the region that really matters to us. And in terms of region, it would be Western Balkans. Khaled? For me, it would be East Africa, uh, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Zambia, and even possibly uh, now an opportunity in Zimbabwe. Uh, and I think there is a real possibility of change. If you look what this Kenya has just gone through uh, in terms of its political elections uh, and has come to some sort of a sense uh, of moving forward, Uganda is a great possibility. Uh, Tanzania, again, uh, I think is on the verge of it. Uh, and so therefore, that region, Zambia is a reasonably okay, we can try and try and work with that. I think if we get that African uh, Eastern region together, possibly, that would be an example to the whole continent to be able to move forward. Uh, Zimbabwe, I know, has got its, its, its issues, but that's in transition now. So, and if we're supposed to concentrate on that, and I think we can make a real change. So I would look at Africa because that's where our biggest issues are uh, in terms of the whole uh, issue with people, with their lives and with, with the prosperity moving forward. And then perhaps we can look at the West side to do that. I think it's important to look at East first, try and get that right and move it across. Okay. Um, we're very close to the end. I'm going to take a, a clutch of questions. We have two hands up here. So let's take these two questions and then uh, um, I'll ask the panelists to, to wrap up. Lady first and then the gentleman. Hi, Georgine Thorburn. I'm in disaster recovery. Um, I'd just like to make a comment because I just find it quite amusing. We're sitting here and I'm hearing lots of things about democracy and our values and uh, how we must, you know, be respected by them. And yet, we are sitting here right now with our whole political base who don't like the results of the democratic vote in the House of Lords and a great majority in the House of Commons trying to undermine the very democracy that they are purporting that we should be promoting globally. So how do they come to terms with their uh, attempts at trying to overturn the leave uh, vote within their political spectrum whilst trying to promote democracy to other parts of the world, the where, of course, we've also added regime change to a lot of the problems. The gentleman in front, and then we'll uh, ask the panelists to wrap up. Uh, hello, Edward Elliott, um, British Foreign Policy Group. Um, so I want to go back to global Britain, and whilst we're sort of still waiting to, to really hear what the strategy behind that is and talk about branding and global Britain, and in light of some of the comments that the panel made, do, do we view global Britain as being a sort of, in terms of a branding exercise, reinforcing the previous br branding of Britain and saying, you know, post-Brexit, nothing's changed, we're still the same reliable, dependable, boring country, or is it uh, a rebranding? And we sort of heard about the difficulties um, of, of rebranding, but kind of there are opportunities there as well. So what, what does the panel view is kind of the government's policy with Global Britain and, and do they agree? What do they think it should be in terms of the rebranding or, or reinforcing our current brand? 
Thank you. I think I ought to answer the question about subversion of democracy <laughs> through House of Lords. <laughs> and I think uh, as, as, um, as a fortunate member of that House, I can tell you that I voted Remain. I still, deep in my heart, believe that I was right. I still despair. I, always, I was born in the Balkans, so I, I hope that 20 years after coming to live here, the Balkans were going to be westernized rather than West would be balkanized. And I believe that we are going through some sort of Balkan stress internally. <coughs> and, but I do understand that in a democratic society, I have to ac accept whatever the result of the referendum was, whether I like it or not. I don't like it, but I think it is my duty to try and make it work. And I will always say I don't like it, but I will make it work because my head says to me, in the democratic society, you accept that. You don't go and blow someone up. You don't go and kill someone. You don't go and, and uh, isolate someone or marginalize someone. But I do think that in a democratic society, I will best prove the values of it externally if I'm allowed to say what I think, if I can have an open debate with colleagues who absolutely don't agree with me. I work for Bernard Jenkins, for example. You can imagine what kind of discussion I have with him. But I like the fact that he and I can sit down and talk it out and have our different views and still be friends. And he understands that I dislike the outcome, but he also understands that I respect it and I will do my absolute best to make it work because I don't think that Britain that is in confusion, and if you want to say, you know, accept this, my, my, my sort of description, balkanized, is good for Britain, is good for Europe, is good for the world. We need to be a country that is absolutely clear where it stands and forge forward. If we are in a messy state forever, we are not good for anyone. P first and foremost, we are not good for the citizens of this country. So I think democracy and the way we understand it can best be projected and shown outside how it works so that we can have a reasonable, open discussion and open conversation about it, but we can all come together and work for what is the best for this country, for the citizens of this country. We can tell your colleagues in the, in the House. I try to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think Kelly. democracy uh, here, and we, we're probably the oldest democracy in the world, isn't about totalitarianism. Uh, we have a democracy, we have a vote, and we decide to agree with the majority votes as taken. Uh, and nobody said that we're detracting from that. What we can do is discuss the detail of how we, we come out. And that's, what, that's what's happening at the moment. And that, again, will be put to a democratic test in the House when there are votes based on that. So just because we've taken a decision, and all of us we represent, there wasn't a huge landslide one way or the other in terms of that. So those uh, MPs who, who, uh, who are representing it, uh, uh, their constituencies which voted to remain, my constituency voted to, to leave. So, you know, th th and I, at the end of the day, I still have to have my own view in that as well. Uh, and I will be held account at the election by the people that vote for me. And that's what democracy is about. Democracy isn't about a single fixed position. Democracy is about the actions that you take once you've been mandated to do something. And ultimately, that is judged by the people that vote for you. And that's where democracy is. And shall I pick up on the yes, please. global Britain uh, comment. I think it's an important statement of intent that Britain is not yeah. going to be inward looking. It is going to continue to be an outward looking international uh, nation engaging with the world, including the 27 member states of the uh, European Union remaining uh, members. And I think that's really important. And now, how we activate that, and you know, using the lean in phrase uh, again, I think is really important. This is a time to be doing more of it. Um, you know, we're in the unfortunate position of uh, having been saying for the last number of years, how we engage in Europe is fine. Um, you know, we're being pushed increasingly into the 0.7%, therefore you know, we're taking money out of Europe and putting it elsewhere. Now we need to work out how to reverse that decision. But the idea of saying we are going to engage, we are going to lean in, is really important. And that's the important thing for me. How we, how we do that, and you know, it's not about posters, it's about a statement of intent and then delivering on it. Okay, well, I'd like to thank my panelists and thank the audience for a superb discussion. Thank you very much, on time as well. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'll you. Good, thank you. Thank you.